All right, as we begin our study, I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 17. We're just going to take a look at a few things there, and we have a lot to cover on a topic of importance. This will be part one. We'll do part two next uh, Wednesday evening. And it's on the subject of the physical death of the believer. We have had several funerals. All of us have been to the funeral service of a friend or family member. And in each case, it's inevitable that you and I are faced with physical death. Not only that of another person's, but our own demise, our own termination, if you will. Both saved and unsaved have this problem. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, uh, what your uh, pedigree is, you are going to die physically. And that goes again for both the saved and the unsaved alike. But the Word of God teaches that there are some differences. If you were to ask the question, uh, is there a difference between the death of a believer and an unbeliever? Uh, the answer is an absolute, emphatic yes. You can contrast the two groups, and you can see that even though both die, even though both have some similarities, there are some differences. Now what we're going to do first of all is look at some background. That'll probably be what we'll do throughout most of the service this evening. Then we'll get into dying grace for the believer. The specialness, the preciousness as it were, of the death of a saint. And that's exactly what the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. But now we are going to also qualify that. There's a difference between saints who die out of fellowship and saints who die in fellowship. The only people who glorify God in death are those who die in fellowship. Everything else is a judgment. So please keep that in mind. That's where we're headed. It's best to die in full fellowship with God under the omnipotent enabling power of God the Holy Spirit. That way, he transfers you. The Lord is my shepherd, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. He's not with you if you're out of fellowship. Um, you go clawing and scraping to stay rather than eager and anxious to go. To be absent from the body present with the Lord, which is far better, says the Apostle Paul. He was anxious to go in a straight betwixt two. Now, we have covered some of this material before, and we're not going to belabor the point. But death, physical death, was caused by Adam's original sin. God said in verse number 17 of Genesis 2, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, in the day you eat thereof thou shalt surely die. It's been covered so many times, it is the Hebrew mouth doubled. And there are two deaths referred to. And when the word is intensive, it means that something actually has transpired, and it's serious. It's, uh, as I usually say in my uh, so-called graveside service, the sin of Adam had grave consequences. And uh, there were two graves actually formed. One in the human spirit. Jesus Christ called the human spirit a sepulcher, a grave, a tomb. And then, of course, the literal one uh, as well for the body. Now, the primary consequence then of Adam's sin, something that happened immediately, was the cessation of spiritual life. Death is cessation of being in certain instances. Now, you have to understand there are several categories of death some of which do not mean cessation of being, but merely separation. But in this case, Adam's human spirit dissolved, disintegrated, evaporated. 
So that is called spiritual death or the cessation of spiritual life. That was the primary thing that happened. But now the secondary thing, which is part of our subject, is the cessation of physical life or what we call physical death. That happens eventually. Now, we know that because of chapter 3, starting with verse number 17. And we have on the screen the two models that we um, usually draw to help us to understand exactly what happened. And unto Adam he said, now remember, he's talking to someone who is spiritually dead. Because you hearken to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the trees which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of your life. In the sweat, verse 19, of thy face you'll eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. Dust you are, dust you shall return. Here's the way Adam was before he sinned. The body was under control of the Bible doctrine that he knew. His soul was completely intact. Of course, in both models, the soul is intact. Um, spiritual death and physical death never mean that the soul sleeps or that the soul evaporates or that you lose your soul life, whether you're a believer or unbeliever. And of course, he had his human spirit intact. When he sinned, he died spiritually immediately. Now that's important because we're going to look at a word uh, called compassion here in just a little bit. I had a question regarding compassion. It said that some, some fundamentalists don't seem as compassionate as some liberal people. They don't seem to care. And that is nonsense. When Adam died, he died immediately spiritually. God had no compassion. You're dead. That's it. He had no compassion when Adam sinned. He did not say, well, I'll give you another chance. He said, you're dead and you're out of fellowship with me. You have no relationship with me. But up here, the human body began to die. The aging process is part of the Adamic curse. Death was never part of the original plan and program of God whether angelic or human. But this gives us a precedent for the compassion of God. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a rabbit's trail here, and we're going to note two concepts. The first of these concepts, of course, is numbered days. Okay, God says, fine. I've had no compassion. I judged you immediately. You're dead spiritually. But compassion, grace, and mercy are virtues that temper God's integrity, righteousness, and justice. Now, we will study them in up upcoming studies. But it's pertinent here to answer the question regarding compassion. So we're going to take this time to note First of all, the concept of numbered days and then the concept of compassion. Because God kept you alive physically, he showed his compassion in a maximum way. God's integrity says, Hi, I'm loyal to the truth and they sinned and they deserved it. But God's compassion said, wait one second, let's give the benefit of the doubt. And because God kept you alive physically, even though you were spiritually dead, without sending you to hell, he gave you an opportunity to rectify Adam's sin. And that is what compassion is. But we'll get to that in a moment. But the concept of numbered days. You and I, as well as the world, face numbered days. And that's what it says here in verse 19 or last part of verse 17, in sorrow you'll eat of it all the days of your life. That implies that his days are numbered. Okay, Adam, you're spiritually dead, but you're physically alive, but you're dying. There is a time clock that is set. You don't know when you're going to die, but between this time and the time of your death, you must rectify your spiritual death. If you don't, then you go to hell. That's, that's God's compassionate work. All right, let's turn then to Psalms 90, verse 12. Psalms 90, 
verse number 12. We're working on the concept of numbered days. Why does God give, believer and unbeliever alike, a certain amount of days? Verse number 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now, applying wisdom for the unbeliever is trusting Christ. Applying wisdom for the believer is learning the elementary techniques of spirituality and advancing in Bible doctrine, staying in fellowship. But you only have a certain amount of days to do that. Therefore, it is absolutely ridiculous to wait one second. Advance prosperity and doctrine. That's the order of the day. Or salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day. Why? Because you may not have a tomorrow. Your days are numbered. And boy, you just, uh, uh, you just want to shake some people who are unbelievers and just want to tell them, look here, you only have so many days to rectify this thing. And if you die in that situation, uh, hell is to pay. But the same thing for believers is sometimes you can't get through that they're supposed to learn doctrine in a systematic way right here in the local assembly. Job chapter 14. I like this verse. <laughs> Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Isn't that the truth? It's no wonder the Apostle Paul said he was in a strait betwixt two. This world is tough. But verse 5 says, Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, referring to God. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. God set the number of days, and you're not going to live one more day longer than what he has determined for your life. Now, that's the norm. There are some exceptions that we will note in just a little bit. There are ways to lengthen your life. You say, yes, pastor, I know. Uh, quit eating rich foods, don't drink, don't smoke, uh, live healthy. Well, that's, that's good, that's really good, that's true. I believe that's true, for bodily exercise profits. But, that's not the way to lengthen your life as far as God's spiritual programs concerned. Okay, so now we move from the first concept of numbered days to that of compassion. Compassion is that virtue of God, and, you, and it's, we are to mirror the virtue of God. We are to give the benefit of the doubt in some cases. While we remain loyal to the truth, integrity, we can say, all right, look, Perhaps uh, you didn't know. Perhaps you didn't understand. Perhaps there were extenuating circumstances that got you in this mess. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Here's more time to rectify it. Here, you're, you're a bank robber, uh, okay? And you've made amends you, and, and, and so forth. Well, it would be good if you hid the money to do what? I mean, if, if it's possible. If you hid it, to give it back. So... Let me, let me see here. What compassion does is allow you the opportunity to rectify. It extends a temporary reprieve of sentence, execution, or consequences based on the benefit of doubt until the burden of proof is clearly established one way or the other. So, on the one hand, God said to Adam, I'm, here's what I'm going to do. No compassion. You ate of that tree, so you are dead spiritually. There's no doubt you ate of it, and the certainty was established. By the way, that you're a child of Adam from the womb uh, was established, and the, the fact that you are spirit it was is established from the fact that you're spiritually dead. God has no compassion on you in that category. None. Now. On the other side, he said, all right, look, you're a child of Adam, and you really didn't eat of that fruit. 
You were judged in him. That's the same as though you were there. But I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. So he extends your physical life to do one thing. Rectify the situation. How do you rectify it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Pick the fruit of a different tree, the cross identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and you rectify what Adam did the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now that's compassion doubt is possible there not really God knows all things but to show you and the angels that he is a God full of compassion not just will not just a God of wrath who wants to simply damn everybody he'll give you an opportunity to prove different than the original Adam and those who believe in Jesus Christ rectify the situation. The others simply identify with their, with their great-great-grandfather, Adam, and are damned like he would have been had he not believed. So what physical life does is eliminate doubt one way or the other as to your culpability. You're either innocent. I, I want to believe in Christ. Righteousness and beauty. Guilty, I reject Christ. And that's why you and others are left physically alive. All right, now let's just expand upon this point a little bit longer by turning once again to Psalms 90. Now we're dealing here mainly with the unbeliever, first of all. Our next lesson will have to do with the believer and in and out of fellowship and dying grace. You see, I want to help you when the time comes, and it's going to come for all of us, to understand where you need to be spiritually when you're facing entering the dimension of eternity in fellowship. Now for the unbeliever, death occurs at the point of the hardness of heart. There is a normal lifespan, there's also an abnormal lifespan, where people are taken ahead of their time. We will see verses of scripture that describe that. All right? First of all, Psalms 90, starting with verse 3. You turn man to destruction. Return, ye children of men. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. You carry them away as with a the flood. They're asleep. In the morning they're like grass grow, that grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows. In the evening it's cut down and withered. We are consumed by thine anger. By thy wrath are we troubled. You have set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. There's the key. Every person has a soul with secret sins. But the secret sin referred to here is rejection of the light that God sends. You've got a secret sin as an unbeliever. You outwardly, you are full of life. You know, it's, uh, it's champagne and caviar. It's uh, everything's good. Hail fellow, well met. But on the inside, there is a harbored bitterness, a harbored rejection, a rebellion against Jesus Christ. But God says, I know your secret sins. For all our days are passed away in wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score and ten, and by reason of strength reach four score. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow. It's soon cut off and we fly away. Now this is referring to man in, in general. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Now note this phrase. According to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Now it's just simply saying that there are people who, though they reject Jesus as Savior, they're not as intense. In other words, God lets them live their normal lifespan. They still go to hell, but he does not solidify the sentence or judgment as he does in some other cases. He takes some people home ahead of time, unbelievers that is, based on their hardness of heart. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 1. 
chapter 21. Here's a good portion of scripture which teaches what I'm uh, trying to illustrate here. If you don't live as an unbeliever, the full term, God is just in taking you into eternity and judging you. Why? It's based on the hardness of your heart. It's based on the fact that if, if you're physically alive, but you've hardened your heart, there's, God can't reach you. He can't send you any more light. It's too late. So he just simply removes you from this life. And that explains the death of even teenagers. Sometimes God will deal with, with these people in such a way, and they just simply reject. Outwardly, it might be different. Uh, they, they might seem to be normal, quote, kids. But... The very fact that he takes them sooner than their normal lifespan is an indication that wherefore do the wicked live and become old? Yea, they're mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them. Their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Now remember, according to fear, uh, so let thy wrath be. Fear of what? People fearing God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Judgment's coming. Their days are numbered. Life is getting shorter. They're going to enter eternity. And they say, I don't care. I won't do what God says. There's no fear of judgment. So, neither is the rod of God upon them. Verse 13, they spend their days in wealth, uh-oh, and in a moment go down to the grave. Verse 16, lo, their good is not in their hand, that they don't hold their own life together. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? How oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributes sorrows in his anger. See, according to fear, so let thy wrath be. They are stubble before the wind as chaff that the storm carries away. God lays up iniquity for his children. He rewards him and he shall know it. His eyes shall see destruction, and he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Verse 21, For what pleasure hath he in the house after him? When the number of his months, note, is cut off in the midst. The number of his months. Remember, we read a portion of scripture a while back where it says that your days and your months are numbered. Here is a wicked person who has them cut off in the midst. In the midst of what? In the midst of a normal lifespan, God says, your heart is hardened. I'm going to take you into eternity now. There's no reason for you to live any longer. I can't get through to you. Uh, you are stubborn. You're mule-headed. I've sent you light, sent you light, and you have simply rejected. Into eternity you go. Now, for the norm... He allows people to live to their three score and ten as unbelievers. But the abnormal death is caused because of those who have hardness of heart. Now, let's just take a, a look, if you will, regarding death of those who are younger. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 12, where it says to young people, honor your father and mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. We say, pastor, that's good, but aren't the Ten Commandments basically for Israel? Yes, that's right. They are. Isn't the land there referring to the land of Israel? Yes, it is. And the principle is set up. If the young people growing up respect their parents and, and follow their parents' true religion in worshiping Jehovah God and so forth, that God is going to give them length of life on the land. Now, how does that work for us who are Gentiles? Notice Ephesians 6, where the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, changes some wording. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 
verses two and three. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, what is the promise he is telling us as Gentile children? That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest do what? Live long on the earth. Rebels don't live long. Rebels harden their heart against the first authority God sends their way that is external to their own soul, their parents. I won't do what you say. I hate you. How I've heard that is as uh, uh, I have been in the ministry of parents coming to me and saying, my child says this to me. It should be met with, um, with uh, a righteous retribution uh, on the seat of judgment. But because they don't do that, they're taken. This is why they die early. That's what it says. To live long, you must start respecting authority. If not, you're not going to respect the authority of God. And what's going to happen? You, God is going to take you. Now, let's go back to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, chapter 10. Verse number 27, again, a verse of scripture. There's a proof text, documentation, that this happens. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be what? Shortened. Shortened. Now again, it depends on how adamant, stubborn they are against the light that God sends them. For example, Romans chapter 9, and then we're going to move on to the next point here. We do have a man in the prime of his life that had his life taken and shortened. Why? Because of the hardness of his heart. Verse 14, Romans 9. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion. Note that word. Compassion on whom. If you start responding to the light, what does God do? He gives you length of time in order to do what? Rectify the situation. That's his ultimate demonstration of compassion. You're, the fact that you're alive and that you have an opportunity to repent and believe, is compassion. So it's not of him that willeth or runneth, but God that shows mercy. And now we're going to look at a verse that says why he shows mercy in a moment. For the scripture says, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up to Pharaoh, that I might show my power in thee and declare throughout all the earth my name. Therefore he has mercy on whom he will have mercy. Whom he will, he does what? He hardens. He forces the issue. I'm sending you light. Let my people go. I will not. Who is God that I should let him go? There was no fear of God in his eyes. Now, Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Verse 8. To whom does God send mercy? The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He'll not always chide, he'll not keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That is, if, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that what? Fear him. Verse 13, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that do what? Fear him. Verse number 17, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that what? Fear him. If you don't fear God according to, to man's fear, he has no fear, so let thy wrath be. And God takes people home because they do not fear God and they harden their heart. All right, when I say home, into eternity. That brings us then to point number two, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15 and point number two. Physical death, says point two, is God's way of terminating the 
Adamic rebellion. Because of Adam's sin, he extended compassion, but because everybody in Adam dies, God terminates with death, physical death, the Adamic rebellion. That's why Paul uh, says in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Resurrection, which by the way, frees us from death, never to be subject to death anymore. Those who are part of that, of that resurrection, whether it's the church or the first resurrection of, um, of the uh, Old Testament saints, never die again. Revelation tells us in the eternal state there's no more death. But the unbeliever only looks forward to the second death. The word in, in both cases, that precedes Adam and Christ is the Greek word in, in the locative of sphere. Those in the sphere of Adam die. The first uh, death, spiritual death. The second death, physical death. The third death, eternal death. They're placed in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Death, death, death in Adam. Even so in Christ, those in the sphere of Christ shall be made alive. Die. Those in Adam die, those in Christ shall be made alive. All right. Now, let's, um, let's move on here then to point number three. As we turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 16. And our third point. Remember, point two is physical death is God's way of terminating for the unbeliever. We're dealing with part one here, basically with unbelievers. It's there. It's God's way of saying, hey, you know, I'm not going to let this thing go on forever. There's an ending point. I will show you my compassion until you're three score and ten, or until you've hardened your heart. Three score and ten years, relatively speaking, is enough time to give you to rectify the original sin of spiritual death. Either you're going to believe or not in that length of time. But if I send you more grace and more light, and like he did to, to Pharaoh in certain instances, and you rebel, I'm going to take you into eternity sooner. Now that's the principle. But... Point three here is that physical death means the cessation, the cessation of physical life only, never soul life or soul consciousness. Now let's look at verse 19 in Luke 16. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously every day. Now you'll note that I have the name Dives here. They brought out the Greek uh, into the Latin, and the Latin word dives means rich man. And so it traditionally uh, uh, became the, uh, the order of the day to call this man dives. His name really isn't given, but uh, if we want to, to put a name to the face here, dives would be a good enough name. Latin, rich man. Lazarus, however, is named. Certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. It came to pass that the beggar died. And, last part of the verse, the rich man also died. Both of them were buried. Now that's the point here. Physical death means cessation of physical life only. Now I'm going to show you why there is no such thing as, uh, as the Jehovah Witness doctrine of soul sleep. Also, Seventh-day Adventists believe in soul sleep and, and the like, the destruction of the soul. That is not true. When the, when the beggar died, Lazarus, note, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So, he had his soul intact, 
and excuse me, I'm drawing not the right figure there. For he had his human spirit intact. Now, how do we know that he went to a place that was um, uh, wonderful, blissful, and so forth? It says, verse 25, Son, remember you in your lifetime received good things like uh, Lazarus, evil things. Now he is comforted, thou art tormented. Even though he didn't have his body, he was alive, he was conscious, he was rewarded in the bliss of paradise. But what about the rich man? He died and was buried. And in hell, verse 23, he lift up his eyes being in torments. And he cried and said, have mercy on me that uh, Lazarus might come over and have water. All right. He had two deaths, the physical death here, his body in the grave, and his human spirit was still, uh, was still dead. It never was regenerated. So he had soul capacity. He could talk. He could think. He could hear. He could feel. But the two deaths stood forever. All right, now let's show again uh, that when a person dies, their body goes to the ground and not their soul. Now, who was the rich man talking to? Abraham. Genesis 15. Genesis 15 and verse 15. God's talking to Abraham, and he says, verse 15, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be what? Buried in a good old age. Now that, that gives us all hope. So when we get to old age, things might be good. Good old age. All right. Chapter 25, verse 8. 25, 8. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Where did, it, where did his body go? His body went right where the body of Lazarus went. But his soul and spirit went to paradise. And that's why there is the phrase in the Bible, gave up the ghost. It just simply means God extracted the soul from the body. The body uh, lay physically dead, but the soul was then brought into paradise so that he could be the supervisor of the place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. All right. I think we've got time just to address one more point here, and we'll take up then next time. We'll finish this study and get on into dying grace for the believer. Point four, physical death is only normal and natural in Adam. People say, well, it's a part of life. And I always want to say, no, it's not. <laughs> you have a little bit of rebel in me. No, it's not. Yeah, it, it, in Adam, yes, it is. And we all have to face it because we're associated with Adam. And in Adam all die, and because we have bodies that, that link, are linked back to Adam, we've got an appointment with death. But after that, the judgment. Oh, no. There's no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. For the believer, it's different. Once we die, we enter a place of bliss. No judgment. But that's not true for the unbeliever. But God's original purpose did not include death. It didn't include sin. You're perfect. You're good, said to Lucifer and Adam. And there is no death found in Christ. Now we're going to see that in just a few moments we have left. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And remember, the two deaths we're talking about. Immediate spiritual death and eventual physical death. 
God shows his compassion in uh, extending your physical life. But if you don't believe, he has every right to at the point of the hardening of your heart to take you into eternity. You're judged already. The wrath of God, uh, uh, John 3, 36, abides on you. If you harden your heart toward the light, he has a right to take you. Death reigned, it says, in verse number 14. Through whom? Through Adam. But now note, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 21, for since by man, Adam, came death, and that the context is physical death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, physical life in Christ. There is no death in Christ. Verse 51, excuse me, look at verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Will not all sleep? Will be changed. A moment in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. This corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal shall be put on immortality. There's no death in Christ. Death is not normal and natural. Yes, in the Adamic realm it is, but not in the Christian realm. Now, why do I say that? Because Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Jesus Christ is now manifest by the appearing of our Savior, or excuse me, um, God's purpose is manifest through the appearing of our Savior. Now what was God's purpose? To abolish death. Therefore, he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Life and immortality. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Whoso believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no death in Christ. And if you fear death, that's because maybe you're not in Christ, or you're not sure of your eternal future. You live in the sphere of Christ, I'm telling you, if you're in fellowship with him, you will step from one dimension into the next. You'll walk across a golden bridge, a, a, escorted by angels, into the presence of the Lord, absent from the body, face to face with Christ. The word abolish there is katergeo, and it means to render lifeless. I like that. He destroys death by killing it. <laughs> That's great. He renders it inactive, or literally, he kills it. He kills death. Death is active now. Uh, I use, always use the illustration of Jaws, and that's a, a beast that's hungry, up from the deep, swallowed down. Down we go, consumed. But Christ said, okay, um, through the cross and the sword, I'm going to kill death. And that's exactly what he did. All right, now, let's just uh, note one verse of Scripture, and we're done, and we'll take this up the next time. Joshua 23. Joshua 23, 14. Where it says, There is some justification for understanding that you are going to die physically. And that there is a normal pattern for this in your association with Adam. Joshua 23, 14. Joshua speaking, saying, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. It's the Hebrew word derek, and it means literally the course of life. And because of our time, we're going to have to, uh, uh, we're going to, have to uh, close with this. But the course of life is this. That you are conceived in the womb, you have a living body but no soul. At the point of birth, the soul is given. You live your life in that body. If you're an unbeliever, and that's basically what we're talking about, until 70 years thereabouts, if you have not rectified the situation, God says, 
I conclude your heart is too hard, you're not going to get saved. He then takes you into eternity, dead body, no soul, but he takes your no soul in the tomb. He takes your soul where the rich man was. Now, again, for the unbeliever, any time between here and here, remember our study, there is an abnormal cutting off of your full life expectation. If in the course of, of your life, uh, or even right before, there's, there is a total hardening of your heart, God might do something to shake you, to let you see you're entering eternity. But if he sees there is no hope of your ever accepting the light and trusting Christ, he can at any point take you into eternity and judge you.